childproof. Are you okay? It's just YouTube people. They don't care. This is lesson number seven of cults, heresies, and false doctrines. Lesson number seven. We'll be catching up. We'll be on lesson number eight in just a week or two. I want to finish up talking about Calvinism, Lord willing, this evening. And so we're on limited atonement. We talked about total depravity. We talked about unconditional election. And I think these ones will go a little bit quicker. Um, we've got limited atonement tonight, irresistible grace, and then perseverance of the saints. And if we get to it, if we've got time, we've got a little bit of history stuff about Calvinism and some of the influential people in Calvinism. And I think that would be interesting and informative uh, information <clears throat> if we get that far. Not totally necessary. So, limited atonement. Why don't we pray first? Lord, pray that you'd help us. Uh, Lord, help me to say the right thing. Help me to make this stuff clear. And pray that you'd uh, be with us this evening. Thank you for giving us a Bible so we can know the truth and not have to rely on the traditions and wisdom of men. We can rely on you and your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Limited atonement is the idea that since, one, God only elected some to be saved, and two, God chose some to remain lost, therefore... Jesus' blood was not shed for the whole world, but it was only shed for those whom he elected. Christ didn't die for all, but he only died for those who would be saved. The idea is since God knew who would be saved and who would be lost because he was the one who chose who would be saved and who would be lost, it would be wasteful, and they believe in a sense irreverent, for Jesus to come and shed his blood for people who wouldn't get saved. They think that Jesus... Uh, didn't go to the cross and hope that people would get saved. He went to the cross knowing who he was dying for, that he only died for the elect, that he did not die for the unelect or the people that would not be saved. The Calvinist thinks that it's an assault on God's power to suggest that God would die and then hope that man would believe. Here's R.C. Sproul's. He says, I quote, I don't think that we want to believe in a God who sends Christ to die on the cross and then crosses his fingers hoping that someone will take advantage of that atoning death, end quote. You are on the wrong footing when you start your statement with, I don't want to believe on a God that. I want to believe on the God that is set forth in the scriptures. I don't want to believe on a God that makes sense to me, although the God set forth in the scriptures makes a lot of sense to me because the scripture explains it. He's just, he's holy, he's righteous. Um, some things don't, some things aren't just holy and righteous, and so you wouldn't figure God to be that way. But what I'm saying is, you, you, it's not good, it's not good to start out with, I don't want to believe on a God that, if that's how God, the Bible sets forth God. Now, the wording that he uses is just, He's crossing his fingers like God's in heaven, a nervous wreck. I hope someone believes. I don't, I don't believe that that's, that's how God is. But I do believe that he shed his blood on the cross and hoped for some to get saved. He shed his, cross, his blood on the cross for everyone. And if he, like we showed, had his will, everybody would get saved. But some people choose not to get saved and God has given them that ability. Okay. So, let's look at some Bible verses. Again, the idea is that God only shed his blood. God only died for certain people. And the Bible is very, very clear that God died for the whole world. Let's show you that from the scripture. Isaiah 53. Number one, Isaiah 53. The Bible sets forth salvation for everyone. The Bible makes salvation available to everyone. It does not speak of election in the sense that some people are elected to salvation. And it certainly, certainly does not speak of a limited atonement in the sense that some people, uh, Christ only died for some people. Look at verse number six. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Now, would anybody argue that the all at the beginning of verse number six is truly all? It doesn't say that only the elect have gone astray, does it? Who has gone astray? Everybody. Who have sinned? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who has turned to their own way? Well, look, everyone to his own way. So 
you and I would agree, and the Calvinist would agree with us, that it would be improper to suggest that the everyone in verse number 6 isn't really everyone. That the all at the beginning of verse number 6 isn't really all. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Now, if you're going to make that all everyone, then you've got to make the next all everyone, because it's in the same exact verse. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Whose sins did Jesus Christ bear to the cross? Not just the sins of the elect. All. Whose iniquity was laid on Jesus Christ when he went to the cross? Not just the iniquity of the elect. He hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ's blood was shed for the sins of the whole world. Look at Mark 16. Mark chapter number 16, number 2. Mark 16. <clears throat> A lot of these references will be important. Mark 16. Mark 16, and he said unto them, verse number 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach the gospel to every creature. It doesn't say some creatures. It says every creature. It doesn't say only the elect creatures. It says preach the gospel to every creature. The, the point of the statement is, is that everybody is to hear the gospel. Now, what is the gospel according to the Bible? Can anybody tell me what the gospel is according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Right. Specifically, so it is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Specifically, 1 Corinthians words it as Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So if the gospel is how that Christ died for our sins and they are to go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, they are supposed to tell all the world and every creature that Christ died for their sins. Either limited atonement is false, or Jesus is telling his followers to go out and lie to the majority of the people to whom they're preaching. Because if I go out and say, Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, and they're not elect, I'm lying. Because Christ didn't die for your sins. Christ only died for the sins of the elect. So either Jesus Christ was telling them to go into the world and preach the gospel to people for whom Christ didn't die and tell them a, a known false statement, Christ died for your sins, or limited atonement is not so. Luke 19. Come to Luke 19, number 3, Luke 19. Luke chapter number 19. Look at verse number 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So, according to Luke 19 and verse 10, who did, who did Jesus Christ come to seek and to save? That which was lost. Anything that was lost, Christ came to seek and to save. Now, here's my question. Who, who was lost? Everybody. There's not, a, there's not a soul alive that is not lost. That is not, right? Everybody, all of a sudden comes short of it. We're all in a lost condition before our salvation. So that would mean that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save everyone. Christ came to seek and save the lost, and all are lost. Then Christ came to seek and save all. Pretty straightforward. Look at Acts 17. Number 4, Acts chapter number 17. Acts 17, look at verse number 30. Acts 17, 30. And at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere. Pretty straightforward. 
not just the elect, God, God's commandment to everyone, everywhere, is that they would repent, which strongly implies they have the ability to do that if they so choose. Look at Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5, verse number 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Jesus Christ is the free gift. Salvation is the free gift offered to who? All men. All men. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, number 6. So what does a Calvinist say to all this? They say, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2. That's, that's what a Calvinist says to all of this. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. I don't, say that, I don't say that mocking. I say that that's actually what a Calvinist told me to all this. That's the answer. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2. Well, that's okay. What about Isaiah 53, Mark 16, Luke 19, Acts 17, Romans 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Timothy 2. 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse number 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for the elect, then were all the elect dead. But he, but that he died for all the elect, that they which live should not... What's it say? Not, not that. Christ explained this because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Okay? Even if you're going to say that, you know, unconditional election is true, you cannot, you cannot, there's no possible way you can say that Christ didn't die for everybody absolutely ignorant according to the scriptures if you believe that. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 2. I don't say that to be mean. You, you have to be ignorant according to the scriptures to look at all these verses that say that Christ died for all and say, no, he didn't. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. The Bible talks about him as being willingly ignorant. We talked about that last time. That's, that's when you look at 12 references that say Christ died for all, you are willfully ignorant. You are purposefully ignoring what God has put in the scripture. First Timothy chapter number two, look at verse number <clears throat> three. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. What's God's will? That everybody gets saved. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. First Timothy chapter number two says the ransom payment of Jesus Christ was for all. Now you better get to that one mediator. Quit going through your religion, quit going through your church, quit going through your good works. There's one mediator, and he gave himself a ransom for you. Whoever you are, you're a part of all. Christ died for your sins, and you can be saved. Get to that mediator. But we see that mediation, that redemption was purchased for all. Not just some people, all people. Not just elect people, all people. Look at Hebrews chapter number 2. Number 8, Hebrews chapter number 2. I'm glad he died for all, because knowing my luck, I probably would not have been elected. Look at Hebrews chapter number two. <laughs> That's just, just my luck. Never win the door prizes. If I played the lottery, I wouldn't win that. <laughs> Hebrews chapter number two, verse number nine. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Every man. If you are a man, meaning if you are part of mankind, we're not just including women, we're saying man as in all people. If you are part of people, Christ tasted death for you. That's what the scripture says. Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. And verse number 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. O brother, believe it. Once for all, O sinner, receive it. Like the hymn we sing, Christ died once for all. All right. 1 Peter 3, 18 says, For Christ also hath suffered, once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The just suffered for the unjust. The unjust is everyone. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And so Christ suffered for everyone. Um, of course, 2 Peter 3, 9 says that, like we said last time, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. Some men count slackness the long-suffering to us, word not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Look at 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2. First John 2 and verse number 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And so the Calvinist comes in and says, see, he's not the propitiation for the world. He's just the propitiation for our sin. He did not die for the sins of everyone. He just died for our sins. He's a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. And the Bible specifically says, lest you should think, I just wanted, I wanted to be really clear in my writing, lest you should think that accident, like maybe I was only talking about people who are saved, I want to make, I want to make sure that you know that it's not just for us. He died for them too. They might not believe it. They might not have received it. They might deny it. They might turn away from it. But he died for those people. He died for the sins of the whole world. So Christ died for everybody. Clearly, clearly from the scriptures. So what are their proof texts besides just yelling Romans 9 and Ephesians 1 over and over again? John chapter 6. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking. I don't say that just to make people mad. That was truly an experience that I had. When I got saved shortly after I got saved, I found out that all my friends were Calvinists. I didn't know that. They just were like church people. Found out the church that I was going to was Calvinist. It was just a mess. So I had lots of fights. I got into it with them a lot before, even actually really before I got saved. Why I cared, I just I don't know. I didn't know what I believed. I didn't believe anything, but I knew I didn't believe that. First John 6. <clears throat> They're good people, though. Other than one of them said that I was lost because I wasn't a Calvinist. That was a little different. John chapter number 6. Here's a proof text, air quotes, for limited atonement. Of course, there's no such thing as a proof text for limited atonement because it doesn't exist. Verse number 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again in the last day. So somehow that's supposed to mean that Christ only died for certain people, and that everybody that he died for will come to him. If only they'd have read a few verses further, 
to see who it is that the Father has given him. All these verses is talking about the Father has given me, right? The Father has given me. Those that the Father give me, I'll lose nothing. Those that the Father give me. Look at verse number 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Who gets raised up in the last day in verse number 39? Those that the Father have given him. Who gets raised up in the last day in verse 40? Everyone that believes on the Son. Okay, so it's not this proprietary, only the elect. Verse number 40 says, this goes for everybody. This goes for everybody. Okay, and then they use John 17 and verse 6 uh, uh, through verse 12. You go down to verse number 20, and that just shows you that this is not speaking about the whole world. John 17 is speaking about his current disciples. He says, I'm not going to lose any of them. He, he talk, look at John 17. Look at John 17, verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou hast given me out of the world. Thine are they, thou gavest unto them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given them uh, the words which thou hast given me, so on and so forth. Look at verse number 20, though. Neither pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. <laughs> So all that statement in the early part of John 17 that Calvinists used to show that the Lord only saved some and the Lord only died for some and those that he did die for will definitely get saved, that was all just speaking about specifically the disciples. The 11, really, it's not even including Judas because we know what happened to Judas. And at the end of it, he says, and I'm not just praying for those, I'm praying for all those that will believe after me. So, not a very good proof text. You say, these seem like really, really weak proof texts. They are very, very weak proof texts. You say, I don't even really see how that goes with, doesn't that go more with the, the, the next point? It, it really does. They're, they're very, very poor, very, very poor proof texts, but those are those are supposed to prove to us this, this idea. And here's the third, our sins. Number three is our sins. Any verse that says Christ died for us, the Calvinist claims that that means only us as in saved people to the exclusion of of the world. And the best answer for this is it's a real stretch. You can't, you can't just make that assumption. You can't go to a passage like 1 Corinthians 15 that says Christ died for our sins and say, well, he's writing the church of the Corinthians, so he's only speaking about saved people. When he says our, he means us to the exclusion of the world. You can't do that. Okay. He, he's writing to Christians. He says Christ died for our sins because he's writing to Christians. He's not writing to the world, right? He's, he's writing to saved people. If I'm speaking to you tonight, I'm speaking to saved people, I'm going to say, isn't it great that Christ died for our sins? And when I say that, I'm talking about me and you and you and you. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about us because I'm speaking to you. But I'm not saying, because I'm speaking to you, I'm not saying he didn't die for the world. We're just talking about doctrine. We're talking about the Bible. We're talking about salvation. And I say, yep, Christ died for everyone in this room. Isn't that wonderful? That doesn't mean he didn't die for the people out in the world. So that's basically what Paul's doing in the scriptures or any other writer in the scriptures when it says Christ died for our sins. He's not excluding the world in that. And it would be very, very foolish to, to just insert into there that, well, he's only speaking about the elect. That's a good example of taking your doctrine to the Bible, not taking doctrine from the Bible. Okay? Um, all these passages say Christ died for all. They say, well, it means all the elect. Christ died for the sins of the whole world. It means the world of the elect. And I guess if you go through your Bible with a ballpoint pen and put of elect, of the elect everywhere, then yeah, that maybe that could work. But you're literally just inserting words in the Bible to, to meet what you believe. And so, not true, not right, incorrect, limited atonement. It's a, it's a hoax. Irresistible grace, irresistible grace, the eye and tulip. Irresistible grace. This is the teaching that those who are elected have no choice but to get saved. That if you are of the elect, you will get saved, whether you like it or not. But you'll like it because God will make you like it. If you are predestined by God unto salvation, no matter who you are, where you are, what you're doing, what you believe, you will, you will be saved probably a bad way to look at it, but honestly, why? I, I, I understand the verb. Don't, don't come in and say, well, you just, you just, you don't understand. That. I understand. We, we shouldn't sin that grace may abound. I understand that, okay? We shouldn't live a life of sin because of the mercy and grace of God. But what would make you care about anything if you believed this stuff? 
If you really believe that everything you thought, said, or did was predetermined by God from the foundation of the world, and that if you're part of the elect, you will get saved, you've got no matter what happens, you'll eventually get saved. And if you're not a part of the elect, you'll never get saved. Why would you put one second of thought into any part, any aspect of your life, anything? Why would you not just do whatever you were going to do and then just, and the sad part about it is a lot of them do. A lot of them do. I, this is a broad brush. I know some Calvinists that are very, very good Christians. I know some Calvinists that are very, very poor Christians. I know some non-Calvinists that are good Christians and poor Christians. But I know some Calvinists that will say, oh yeah, you know, God predetermined everything from the foundation of the world. And they live like a heathen. They drink, they cuss, they watch worldly movies and listen to worldly music and dress like harlots and just act in the most uh, unchristian manners and say, I'm a Calvinist, and you just can't help but wonder if that doctrine plays into some of that. God could do, God made me this way. God made me do. Well, what would it do to young people? And I'm not look as a as a saved, born again, in some ways I guess spiritually, you say spiritually mature, some ways spiritually mature I guess, educated in the Bible. Okay, I know the doctrine. I know that. For, from my position, I can look and say, well, I wouldn't just go live a life of sin just because I could. But if I were, if you give this stuff to a 13 year old right, who's not saved and not spiritually mature and haven't spent years of their life studying the Bible and, and overcoming temptation and trying to live like a Christian and set in the, and you tell them everything's predetermined, everything you say or do is, is set by God from the foundation of the world for his glory, that if you're saved, you're saved, and if you're lost, you're lost, and if you're elect, you'll get saved, don't worry about it. Could you imagine giving that kind of doctrine to a kid? And what they might do with that? You and I have the maturity to sit here and say, well, we shouldn't sin, the grace may abound. Some 13-year-old kid, you know, raging with lust and hormones and, and wanting to experience the world and experience life and tired of the stuffy church uh, life and parents make it. They're going to take that and run with it. I'll get saved if I'm supposed to get saved. I'll be like all the other people got elected and I'll get saved in my 30s, you know, after I realize how bad my life has been until this point. But until then, I'll just, I'll just have fun. It's a, it's a very serious, hurtful, damnable heresy. I believe there's people that stay lost because they believe in this Calvinism, particularly irres irresistible grace. Um, most Calvinists will point out that irresistible grace does not mean that God's grace is irresistible, which means you should probably change the name of your doctrine <laughs> if you're going to call it irresistible grace. What is generally meant by irresistible grace is that eventually, in his timing, God will overcome your resistance and cause you to want to be saved. So it is irresistible. <laughs> irresistible grace doesn't mean irresistible grace. What we mean by irresistible grace is that it's irresistible grace. <laughs> God will eventually, what it's saying is God will eventually make you want to get saved, right? God will overcome your, your prejudices. God will overcome your your animosity towards the gospel, and eventually he'll bring you to the point where you want to get saved. And so it is good to know that because we like to you know, point at verses and say, well, what about this? What about this? And the Calvinists come back and say, well, people can resist. But then again, they say he, you can't resist God, and you can't resist his will. So uh, it's just a strange doctrine all the way around. God wants you to be saved, but then he makes you resist because he's the one who makes everything happen. Eventually he stops making you resist, and decides to make you believe. That's Calvinism and irresistible grace in a nutshell, and it just isn't biblical. Okay, God's grace is resistible. There are plenty of people whom God wants to be saved who die in their sins and go to hell. Acts 7 and verse 51 says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Now, Calvinist again will point to that and say, well, it's not that it's irresistible, it's that eventually the elect will stop resisting. That's, that's what they say. Eventually, you will get saved. Um, Acts 7.51 says these people were looking at, at the Holy Ghost and resisting him. Chapter number two, John, uh, number two, I'm sorry, point number two, John chapter number three and verse number 18. He that believeth on him, is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
Okay, look at Romans. Oh uh, no, look at look at Titus two. Titus chapter number two. Titus chapter number two. Titus 2, and verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So, follow this logic with me. God's grace has appeared to all men, correct? Do all men get saved? No. Some men, obviously, according to the Bible, die lost, unfortunately. Lots of people die lost. Grace has appeared to all men, yet not all men are saved. That means some people resist the grace of God. Look at Hebrews chapter number 2. Uh, let me just read you this one, uh, because we read it already. This We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So the same line of thinking, Jesus Christ tasted death for every man, is that, and that is described as the grace of God. Not every man gets saved, and so many people resist the grace of God in their life. Again, 1 Timothy 2, 4. We've been here, I think, twice now, so we won't go a third time. But God will have all men to be saved. Do all men get saved? No. God wants all men to be saved, but not all men end up saved. And so it would not be logical to say that his grace is irresistible, that he'll eventually make everyone believe who he wants to be saved because he wants everybody to be saved, but not everybody gets saved. Look at Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So how does it work according to the Bible? It's not God has grace and then it's irresistibly you're forced to believe it. You have faith and then you have access to God's grace by your faith. Okay, no, it's not by works, okay? It's not, a, it's not a good work. It's not a, you know, I've attained some sort of righteousness. God told me to leave. I believe, and so he gave me salvation. Okay? Um, let's look at some proof texts. John 10. John chapter number 10. After this, we're going to look at the five points of biblical Christianity, and they're it's pronounced and it's Bible, 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 and Bible. John 10 and verse number one, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Okay, all of that's true. How do you become a sheep? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. None of this is saying, if you're pre-elected, you know, before the foundation of the world, you're predetermined and, and unconditionally elected and all, all this stuff, then... When you hear Jesus' voice, you'll come. You'll have no choice. That's not what it's saying. It says if you're a sheep, you'll know his voice. How do you become a sheep? You get saved. How do you get saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so again, you got to take that mindset to that passage. But once you just read the passage and let the Bible make you think how you ought to think, it becomes very, very clear. Galatians 1.15. Uh, Galatians 1.15. This is an interesting place to go. Galatians 1.15, see how this holds up. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, oh, from his mother's womb he was called. Why? To reveal his son in me, that I might preach among the heathen. 
this is not talking about Paul's salvation. This is talking about calls to the ministry. Paul's call to the ministry, okay? Now, you also can, I'll admit, it's a different situation, right? The fact that somebody was called to be a preacher from his mother's womb, it, that's unique. But you can't take a special man's special situation and then apply it to all mankind's salvation, okay? So I'll give you that there was, there was some predetermining there. And I think it was also determined on Paul's obedience to the Lord. I mean, Paul, uh, the Lord arrested him on that road uh, to Damascus and clearly, you know, showed himself to him. But I, I think Paul could have denied. I think Paul could have said, I know who you are and I just don't, I'm not doing it. I'm not believing on you. Okay, so I, I understand that there was some special circumstances there, but you can't take that and apply that to everybody. You can't say that my salvation was like Paul's salvation because the news for you, you're not Paul. <laughs> and I'm not Paul. And my salvation was not like Paul's salvation. I wasn't you know, predetermined from the womb to be the assistant pastor at Bear Trail. So God made me get saved and put me in the, that's Okay, I would be very conceited to think that way and uh, align myself with the Apostle Paul. All right, so that's irresistible grace. How about perseverance of the saints? Last point here, and then maybe we'll fly over some of this material just because it's interesting. This should only take a moment. Perseverance of the saints. If there was any point in, in the five points of Calvinist that, that comes close to being correct, it would be this one, but, but even there it's not. It's sometimes referred to as the preservation of the saints. At first look, it seems like it could be true. Um, Here's what it's talking about. The uh, preservation or perseverance of the saints is talking about the fact that a saved person won't lose their salvation. Okay, now, we believe that once a person is saved, he's always saved. We do not believe, because the Bible does not teach, that a person can lose their salvation. However, there's a difference between how we present it and how the Calvinist presents it. We might come to the same conclusion. Okay, you come to the end, and both, both of us believe that once you're saved, you'll remain saved. But we arrive to that conclusion in very different ways, and it's a very important distinction. Okay, we believe that we cannot lose our salvation because Jesus died for our sins, and my sins have been taken away, right? If I go and commit adultery or murder, the Bible says, blessed is the man to whom God will not impute iniquity. That iniquity is not imputed to me. Romans chapter number four, God takes David as the example and points to the man who committed, we just talked about in the last class, the probably two worst sins that you commit, honestly. If you're going to pick the top two sins, like the worst of the worst sins, way up there would be murder and adultery. If you want to get it a little bit broader, you could say murder and, and just sexual perversion. Those, those are, I mean, you talk about bad, that's bad. And God uses that man, David, as an example and says, somebody, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compare the Christian to David and say that your sins cannot be imputed to you. Praise the Lord. Just like the Lord looked at David and said, your sin's not imputed to you. The Lord's put away your sin. The Lord looks at me and doesn't impute my iniquity to me. So I'm not saying that I live a sinless life after I get saved. I, I, I do all sorts of things after I get saved. But if I have salvation, the Bible says the Lord does not impute that iniquity to me. It's not given to my account. Why? Because the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been applied to my account instead. Again, Romans chapter number four. Uh, I believe on Jesus Christ. And Romans four describes the blessedness of being given righteousness, not of works. I believe on Jesus Christ and my faith is counted for righteousness. And so I'm given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Legally before God, I stand as righteous as Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not claiming to live as righteous as Jesus Christ lived. You'll never hear me say that because not yet. One day, one day, one day I'll be given a new body and I'll be able to be sinless until then I'm in this flesh. But the Bible says judicially, before God, the sin that I commit in this body is not imputed to me and therefore I have eternal security. Therefore, I am sealed to the day of redemption because the, G the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been given me 
and my sin was laid on him, and he died on the cross for all my sins, past, present, future. They've all been taken away. They're buried. They're gone. They're in the sea of God's forgetfulness. They'll never return. And in their stead, I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to me as a free gift and applied to my account. And when God looks at me, he doesn't see me. He doesn't see my sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. Praise the Lord. That's, that's the doctrine of eternal security. That's what we believe. Perseverance of the saints teaches that God will keep his people from committing a sin bad enough that they could lose their salvation, or that if they do commit a really bad sin, he will cause them to repent and be restored. The idea behind perseverance, perseverance of the saints is that if they deny the faith and then never repent and come back to the faith, it is evidence that they were never saved in the first place. Okay, so the conclusion is the same, that, that you know anybody who's saved will stay saved. But the Calvinist says, God won't allow you to do something so bad as to get lost again. And if you do something so bad as to get lost again, God will be sure. If you do something so bad, like walk away from the faith or deny the faith, or you do some sort of terrible sin uh, that causes you to lose your salvation and you never repent, never get it right, that's evidence that you probably weren't elect in the first place. Do you see the difference there? It's a, it's a very big difference. We believe, I do all sorts of bad things, the sins that I imputed to me. They believe that God won't let you or allow you to do something that will cause you to lose your salvation. I, I believe, I would never do this, but if I denied the faith, if I said, you know what, I don't, I don't know about all this, I don't, believe, I don't believe on Jesus Christ anymore. I don't think there is a Jesus. I don't think there is a God. I don't think anybody died for anybody or rose from the dead. I'm done with it and walked away. The Bible says I can deny him but he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. And because I've been put in him and I'm not me, I'm part of his body, he cannot deny me. The Calvinist believes if I do that and never repent, then I must have never been elect in the first place. You understand the difference? I hope you do. It's, it's very different. Okay, a little history of Calvinism. Uh, hmm. So those, those are the five points. Those are the five points of Calvinism. And... Let's talk about this history. Calvinism didn't really start with Calvin. As Calvin got much of his doctrine from Augustine, uh, but Augustine took much of his doctrines, including election, sovereignty, foreknowledge, and total depravity from the Manichaeans, the Gnostics, and the Stoics, which were different religions and Christian, so-called Christian heresies of his time. Augustine, uh, he lived in the... 300, so he's like way back there. Uh, Augustine was a Roman Catholic, and he was fraught with doctrinal and personal issues. As a young man, Augustine lived after the flesh. He attended school in Carthage. It was during this time that he converted to Manichaeism, which is an ancient dualistic religion that counted Buddha, Zoro, Zoroaster, and Jesus as prophets. So that's how he got his beginning. Augustine converted to Christianity at the age of 31, but it must be explained what's meant by converted and what's meant by Christianity. Okay, Christianity, remember we talked about this in our Catholic class, Christianity is just anything that names the name of Christ as far as history goes, as far as writer, secular history writers. So when people say he converted to Christianity, it's not that he trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation and got saved. He became a Catholic. He moved from Manichaeism to Catholicism and said, okay, I'm going to believe this Catholicism thing now. And so he converted to Christianity at age 31. He went on to become a Catholic priest and is considered a saint by the Catholic Church. There are a number of doctrinal and moral issues concerning so-called Saint Augustine. And I've got 16 of these. You don't need to remember. Um, you don't need to remember any of these. There's, you won't be tested on the history portion of Calvinism. You'll be, you'll be tested on the doctrinal portion of Calvinism. So I just want to give you this stuff for your information. I would recommend that you, you write it down, file it away, maybe for future use. But number one, Augustine does not have a clear salvation testimony in writing. No salvation testimony of him getting saved biblically like Bible salvation, just him converting to Catholicism. So probably dealing with a lost man. Two, he accepted the Apocrypha as Scripture. Three, he was an, uh, an amillennialist, which means he did not believe in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. A, an atheist is somebody who does not believe in God. A millennialist, somebody who doesn't believe in the millennial. 
uh, millennium. Number four, he considered the devil to be presently bound. So you don't rightly divide the word of truth. You come up with all sorts of wacky doctrines. And he goes into Revelation where the devil's bound. He thinks that's happening right now, that the devil was presently bound at that time. He equated the church with the kingdom and said the church was reigning now. He baptized infants, as did John Calvin, and claimed that unbaptized infants went to hell. He taught baptismal regeneration. She got saved through baptism. He thought that Mary was sinless and permitted her worship. So it's just a Roman Catholic. He believed in the Roman Catholic idea of intercession by the saints. He believed in transubstantiation. He added sacraments to salvation. He believed there was no salvation outside the Catholic Church. He believed in purgatory. He believed the church had descended from Peter. He believed that you had to be a vegetarian. He believed that... Uh, Sexual activity, even within marriage, was only for reproduction, and any pleasure derived from it was wicked. So he was crazy, and he believed all sorts of crazy Catholic doctrines. What does this have to do with Calvinism? You might ask, well, John Calvin said the following, quote, Augustine is so holy within me that if I wished to write a confession of my faith, I could do so with all fullness and satisfaction to myself out of his writings, end quote. So Calvin said, I could take the books that Augustine has written, Bible aside, I could just take his books, and I could draft a confession of faith using his writings. That doesn't mean Calvin believed everything that Augustine believed, but he believed enough of it to be able to draft. That's, that's who he got a lot of his beliefs from, a person like that. Do you want to have anything to do with somebody like Augustine? Do you want your doctrine in any way, shape, or form to come from somebody like Augustine? No. How about John Calvin? We'll go through this quickly. John Calvin was a Frenchman born in 1509. He was a very prominent and influential reformer during the Protestant Reformation. Okay, that's when the Protestants came out and tried to reform the Catholic Church. The ideas of Calvinism were not unique to Calvin, but he was the first to organize them and set them forth in a systematic way, particularly in his very important book, Institutes of the Christian Religion. So Calvin became prominent as the kind of setter forth of these views, not because he created them, but because he was the one who really systemized them and made them understandable and published them uh, to the public in a way that could be understood. And so it became known as Calvinism. Calvin began his life as a philosophy student with intentions of becoming a Catholic priest. Uh, but at the behest of his father, he abandoned this path and became, began studying to become a lawyer. Somewhere in the late 1520s or early 1530s, Calvin converted from Roman Catholicism to the Reformation. Okay, now. There is no clear salvation testimony in writing of John Calvin. Okay? He speaks of being shown the truth. He speaks of realizing his sinfulness and his error in the Catholic Church. He speaks of turning to God and leaving the Catholic Church for the truths of the Reformation. And although his writings from then on out speak about salvation being by grace alone, there are no clear accounts written of Calvin trusting in Jesus Christ for the salvation of his soul. It is a possibility that he was an unsaved man. Now, just because he didn't write it doesn't mean that he wasn't saved, but he was a, a writer. That's what he did. He wrote and he preached, and, and a lot of his sermons were written down. And so you'd think that somewhere in there he'd talk about his salvation testimony. He did not. It's very unclear when he converted and what that conversion was to, whether it was to saving faith in Jesus Christ or a conversion to the Reformation. Calvin eventually, and this is just condensing everything so quickly, but it, you don't need all these long, boring details. Calvin eventually settled in Geneva, Switzerland, which became the center of his work. In Geneva, there grew a tight bond between church and state, which resulted in religious ideas of the church being instituted as common law. Okay, it wasn't like you're so used to now, you've got Mount Airy, and you've got all these churches that have decided to put up their church building in Mount Airy. You've got Cana, and you've got churches in Cana. That's not how it used to be. You'd have Geneva, and then you had the church at Geneva. And it was a Roman Catholic church, and the city and the church kind of worked hand in hand together, right? There was not a separation of church and state. They were together. Roman Catholicism sort of ruled the land. So Calvin comes to Switzerland, uh, comes to Geneva, and he begins reforming this church, meaning he wants to take it away from the, the abuses of Catholicism and restore it to the doctrines of the Reformation. Okay, so his doctrine and that of his, his peers and some of the other people at that time, that's what he wants to do with this church and so with this city. Calvin was the head of a self-created consistory, which was basically a church court. 
Okay, so this was where you'd go ju be judged for your crimes against the church. The church had limited power as far as sentencing, but Calvin was able to use the city government to carry out the laws of religion. So the government of the city was really the one who could pass the sentences, but the church was so intertwined that the two really worked together. And this was not unique to Geneva, but it, it did take place in Geneva underneath Calvin. Calvin's consistory, which was, the again, the church court, was described in this way. It was an overt totalitarian regime. A kind of religion police was empowered to inspect people's houses, to ascertain, uh, ascertain they behaved according to Calvin's ordinances. Rosaries and relics were forbidden and became illegal to name children after saints. Immoral or Catholic books were proscribed. Art, music with instruments, dancing, and theater were no longer allowed. The colors of clothing, hairstyles, and amount of food permissible at the table were regulated. Gambling, drunkenness, adultery, promiscuity, immodest dress, profane songs, idolatry, heresy, and speaking ill of the clergy were punished, often by exile or execution. The press was severely censored. Education, which Calvin regarded as inseparable from religion, was carefully regulated. New schools were established with emphasis on arithmetic, writing, history, and primary school, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, secondary school, facilitate study of the Bible. Uh, inarguably, people shouldn't be committing adultery. Inarguably, people shouldn't be going to uh, theaters and singing uh, profane songs and dressing immodestly. But you can't set yourself as the head of the church state and start enforcing that stuff by going to people's houses and, are you eating too much food? This seems like a little bit too much food for you. <laughs> this might be gluttony. Exile him. Punish him. Bring him before the, the church court. I heard that he criticized the pastor. Well, kick him out of the city. <laughs> the people and leaders of Geneva went back and forth in their opinions of Calvin. It was kind of a tumultuous sort of situation for Calvin. Uh, some people opposed him. He was actually banished at one point, and then he was brought back. This is really important. During his time at Geneva, Calvin strongly opposed those who opposed him, and it's a simple matter of fact that John Calvin consented to the death of multiple people whom he deemed heretics. People like to say, oh, no, he didn't do that. He didn't really do that. It wasn't him that killed him. It was other people. That Calvin, Calvin was okay with and promoted their execution. Jacques Gruet. He wrote a crit critical letter uh, about Calvin and put it in Calvin's pulpit. He was arrested, tortured, and eventually beheaded with the instruction, direction, and consent of John Calvin. And then you have Michael Servetus. Michael Servetus was an anti Trinitarian who strongly opposed Calvin and his doctrines. He wrote many letters back and forth to Calvin and eventually sent Calvin a copy of Calvin's own book, heavily marked to point out errors. John Calvin was very angered by this and was quoted as saying, Servetus offers to come hither if it be agreeable to me, but I am unwilling to pledge my word for his safety. For if he shall come, I shall never permit him to depart alive, provided my authority be of any avail, end quote. So Calvin says, if, if I have a say in the matter, I'll kill him if he shows up here. Servetus was a known troublemaker, a heretic, and an anti-Trinitarian. All of this is true. None of this is grounds for death. Servetus was arrested by the Roman Catholics and sentenced to burn. He managed to escape on his flight to Italy. He was arrested in Geneva, where Calvin was in charge of the church. Servetus was sentenced to be burnt alive at the stake. Calvin was consenting to his death. If I were to believe these false doctrines of Calvinism, I would never call myself after this man's name. It's questionable that the entire movement is named after him. Oh, we're not Calvinists, we're Reformed. Many of them, most of them, refer to themselves proudly, unashamedly, as Calvinist. That's not, that's not somebody to follow. That's not somebody to pattern your church and your doctrine after. Okay, go to the Bible, not to a man. So I'm not a Calvinist. I wouldn't be a Calvinist because it's unbiblical. Let me say this, I'm not an Arminian either. Okay, the first thing Calvinists are going to do to you when you talk to them and say, oh, you're not a Calvinist, you must be an Arminian. No, I'm not an Arminian. You, you might call me an Arminian. I call you a Calvinist because you call yourself a Calvinist. I've never called myself an Arminian. I'm a Bible believer. I believe in the Bible. Yeah, but what you believe is what Armi Arminius preached. And Ar Arminius, Arminius was a guy who opposed Calvinism and predestination, basically. And so, well, you got your stuff from... No, I did not. I got my stuff from the Bible. So there happened to be somebody who 
also wasn't a dope and disagreed with the crazy doctrines of Calvin. That doesn't mean I got it from him, right? This guy had some sense in his brain and said, well, Calvin's wrong because of this, 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 and this. And now I'm an Arminian? No, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. And our Arminians believe that you can lose your salvation. I don't believe that, so I'm not an Arminian. There you go. Okay, that's all the time we have this evening. Thank you very much. Hope that was helpful.